Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you all. Um, for those who don't know me, my name's Jen, and I'm a member of the congregation here at St. James by the Park. And I'm just going to share some thoughts about that reading that we've just had from Acts. So I wonder, it could be the first slide, sorry, thank you. I wonder what comes into your mind when you hear the word community. It's, um, it's a word that we use a lot these days, isn't it? Usually it's used to refer to a group of people who have something in common, maybe something racially in common, like the black community or the Jewish community, or about an issue of sexuality, the transgender community, or about a common interest or lifestyle choice, the gaming community or the vegan community. This passage is about the very first church community. And to be honest, when I first read it, I thought it read a little bit like a self-satisfied Facebook post or one of those annual Christmas letters from that family who seemed to have it all together. Dear friends, we hope all is well with you this Christmas season. We have had a very blessed year in Jerusalem. We have mostly been devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread. To be honest, we're all in awe about the many wonders and signs we're witnessing. We're just loving being with our church family every day. And little Johnny is well. Last week he sold all his toys and gave the money to the poor. We can hardly cope with all the new Christians that God is sending us every day. Could there really have been a church like this? Well, yes, but we have to remember the the context of its conception. We are in the days just after Pentecost, only 50 days or so after Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. But many of these church members would have met Jesus personally, and they're still reading from the extraordinary events of the past few weeks They had just experienced the coming of the Holy Spirit and were so filled with the Spirit that it was as if selfishness had been swallowed up by love. This was a very special community, born out of exceptional and unique circumstances. It had a beautiful temporary honeymoon period. But four chapters later, the community are dealing with a disagreement about the distribution of food, And by chapter 15, they're having some pretty robust theological discussions going on, which bring significant tension. But despite this, we can still look at this Instagrammable moment of church community history and be inspired and learn from it. So this morning, I just want to home in on four things I think this passage has to teach us about community. So the first of these is that community is godly or of God. I think sometimes we humans like to think that community was our idea, but the truth is that long before people ever walked the earth, God was already in community with himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always existed together as one God in this mystery that we call the Trinity. Many of you will recognize this beautiful icon by Andre Rublev, which was created in the 15th century. It is entitled The Trinity. And although it depicts the story of Abraham meeting the three angels in Genesis 18, it's full of symbolism and is widely interpreted as a representation of God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look. The body language the facial expressions, the setting around a meal table, all communicate the bond and respect and love between the three figures. Each person of the Trinity has the same purpose and defers to the others, which creates this beautiful oneness. God is community. And even more mind-blowing is that we are invited into God's community. We're invited to come and eat with them and converse with them and love them and be loved by them. What an amazing thing. Once you understand that God was a beautiful, whole, loving community from before the start of time, you can't help wondering, why did he create humans? If he had all the love he needed within himself, why create us who would fall and mess up? 
but there's just something in God's DNA that desires to draw others into his love to share the fellowship and acceptance and joy within the Godhead. He longs to include and embrace and extend the community. We see this so clearly in the life of Jesus, don't we? Those arms of love thrown open wide to welcome all and sundry. Come and see, he invites us. And what's the first thing that Jesus does when he starts his ministry? He creates a community. A community of vastly different individuals, all gathered around him. More about that later. And what does Jesus pray for in his last hours before going to the cross? He prays for unity. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through this message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. What God loves and values and embraces and participates in and advocates and what God prays for is community, Come unity. This is his intention for us because if this is what he is and what he invites us into is the community of God. So community is godly. The second thing I wanted to draw out of the passage today is that community is intentional. True community doesn't just happen. It needs a fair bit of intentionality. We saw in the passage how the members of this very first church community met together every day in the temple courts. This was something they prioritised in their busy lives because they understood the value of it. They went to one another's houses to eat. They prayed together. They studied together. There's a reason why we use that metaphor of building community. It needs one brick laying on top of another. It takes time and intention, and effort. How many of you here took part in the Go Dine Together sessions um, that we've been having in our church over the past few months? Dan did. Excellent. Oh, and so did Lynn. Brilliant. (laughs) Here's a picture of our group. Um, What a blessing that was. And yet, when I first heard about it, I must admit, my first reaction was, oh no, Life is already so very busy. I was already struggling to find time to meet with the friends I already had. How was I going to fit in another group? Plus, I'm an introvert. Time spent in groups is quite difficult for me. I'm much happier in a one-to-one situation. However, Paul, my husband, was really up for it. So I reluctantly agreed to be a good wife and support him in this. And honestly, I am so glad that I did. The food was awesome. The family atmosphere was so precious. And I got to know some amazing people on a much deeper level than I would have done otherwise. Yes, it was tricky to find times when we could all meet together. But setting aside that intentional time to be together was so special and so fruitful. So community is intentional. However... There are a couple of caveats that I wanted to uh, raise. Caveat number one. There is a danger. If we focus on the fact that community is intentional, we can start to think that community happens solely because of the intention and effort that we put in. And actually, community is intentional, but paradoxically, it's not created by us. It is spirit-fueled. And I like to think of this by comparing a motorboat with a sailboat. If we think of a motorboat as a community being powered solely by effort and intention that we humans put in, we decide how fast it goes, where it goes, we put in the fuel of our own efforts, and it runs until we run out of gas. In comparison, a godly community is a bit like a sailing boat. We can put the sails up, and point them in the right direction, and be ready. 
But it is only by God's Spirit blowing on us that the magic happens. I just wonder how that could apply to you and the communities that you're part of. The second caveat is about spreading ourselves too thinly. I don't know about you, but the opportunities for becoming parts of various communities online or in person is seemingly endless. With Facebook groups and sports teams and music ensembles, neighborhood groups, work teams, circles of friends, we can be part of so many different groups that we're never really, truly present in any of them. And of course, it's good and healthy to have a variety of people we associate and spend time with, but sometimes we can use this as a way of hiding from others and ensuring that we only ever have superficial relationships. We need to be discerning about which communities God is calling us to be part of for this season. I wonder what God might say, be saying to you about this. And the third caveat is remembering that the most important community we are called to is the community of the Trinity. Time spent with God is the most precious time. Communing with him is a blessing to him and also to us and to others. We are changed by the time that we spend with God. What we are able to bring to our communities will be changed by the time that we spend with God, with that primary community. I wonder when and how you'll spend time with God this week. So, we've looked at the fact that community is godly, and that community is intentional but spirit fueled And the third thing I wanted to draw out from the passage is that community is costly. And at first glance, that might seem a bit negative. Um, In these days of cost of living crisis, anything that sounds costly uh, can make us inwardly groan or even outwardly groan. But if something is truly of value, then it costs something. Maybe not money, but it costs something. In the passage, we see how all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So in this case, part of the cost was financial. They shared their physical possessions, and sometimes that is what is asked of us in community. But I believe that's only one expression of what it really costs us to be in community. And what it costs us is to put aside our individual wants and needs and preferences and rights for those of the whole community. And that is hard. In our Western culture, we're conditioned to think that it's all about me and that the individual is the most important thing. But living in community changes this idea. For the community to thrive, individuals must sometimes lay aside what they feel is best for them, and embrace what is best for the whole community. This is maturity. It takes time and a lot of grace and often a lot of pain. Because in our natural state, we act in a way to protect ourselves, to advance ourselves. And we need to believe that we are right and that we do things the right way. And when someone challenges our rightness, we can feel any number of unsettling emotions. Maybe we feel affronted, or puzzled, or angry, or bewildered. It can feel like our boat of security is being rocked. But actually, these moments are a gift. They give us the opportunity to examine our thoughts and beliefs, and to grow as a person and as a Christian. They are very often the means by which God works out sanctification in us. The way he shows us the rough edges that he would so love to smooth off with his love and his grace. And when we're living in community, these moments present themselves frequently. Uh, There's a reason why monks and nuns are some of the most grounded, secure people you'll ever meet. 
Basically, they've been living a masterclass of community 24-7, with endless opportunities to be annoyed by and to annoy their fellow community members. In community, we learn very quickly and vividly about ourselves, and not always the pretty bits. I first became a Christian when I was 20, uh, through the Alpha course, actually. So I had learned all the right stuff. That to come back into a relationship with God, I needed to repent of my sins and accept Jesus' free gift of salvation. So I duly made a list of my sins, as far as I could discern them at the time. But in general, I actually thought I was quite a nice person, really. It was only a year later when I started working as a teacher and having to work closely every day with teenagers that the wheels of my niceness started to come off. I discovered that it's easy to be a patient, loving person when you're mainly interacting with patient, loving, compliant people. But put me in an environment where people seemed intent on winding me up, disrespecting me, and generally communicating that I wasn't worth listening to, And suddenly, a new Jen emerged, an angry, vindictive, impatient Jen. And of course, that Jen had always been there. She just needed the right circumstances to show herself. I was so sad and confused. Is this really me? And this sent me to the arms of God, where I learned about myself and also about his grace on a totally new level. I wonder if you've ever used a metal detector or watched someone else using one. You often see people down the beach, don't you, with these things, sort of scanning the sand, waiting for that beep, beep, beep that tells them that there's something there. And then they get their spade or their trowel out and start digging to find out whatever is hidden behind under the sand. And sometimes it's an old tin can And sometimes it's treasure. We need to activate our learning moment detector. And thankfully, it's fairly easy to realize when it's beeping. Basically, any time you feel your emotions strongly provoked by others, that's the time to dig carefully. There's something there to be discovered and examined with God. And though you may think it's only an old tin can and pretty ugly... Our God has this amazing ability to work so patiently with us and transform what looks dead and ugly into something beautiful, into a treasure. So when we pay attention to those moments when others draw from us feelings of anger, frustration, outrage, discomfort, despair, confusion, God will use them to draw us closer to himself. One of my favorite Christian authors, Lacey Borgo, says, learn to linger with what provokes you. Very wise. And community is definitely a place where you will be provoked. So pay attention to those beeps of your learning moment detector. Community is the furnace where we are all purified. It's God's school of holiness. It's costly and it's uncomfortable. But is it worth it? Well, I think so. Because I have experienced that community is the riches out of which God's generosity flows. We've already talked about how God is community and how he wants community for us. In the passage, we see that this very first church community was a blessing to those within it, but also a blessing to the whole city. It says the community enjoyed the favor of all the people and also God added to their number daily those who were being saved. This wasn't a community just for community's sake. It drew others to God. It shared the blessing. It welcomed others in. And in fact, as we look back through the Bible, we can see that this is always God's plan to bless a people who would in turn be a blessing to others. Jesus followed this model, building around him a community of disciples who knew him and imitated him and brought others along to experience this blessing. 
I don't know if any of you have watched any of the series called The Chosen. Anyone seen that? A few people. This is a shot from it. <laughs> it follows the life of Jesus and his disciples that he called to journey with him. And it sticks mainly to gospel accounts, but adds in sort of backstories and other imagined elements. It's brilliant and thought-provoking, and I heartily recommend it to you. But one of the things that really stands out to me about it is the way that it portrays the disciples being suddenly thrown into very close community with others who may have had a very different experience and worldview from them. There's quite a bit of tension between various individuals as the group forms and storms. But what holds them together is Jesus. There is huge diversity in what they believe, their traditions, their ideas, but they are all called to gather around Christ. And in fact, their differences bring a richness and a depth to the community. They are stronger because of the fact that despite their differences, they are unified in the love and devotion to Jesus. And I do wonder if there might be something we can glean from that in our own church community. Our diversity and our differences need not divide us, but could, in fact, deepen our love for one another and amplify the witness we give to a watching world of our good and powerful God. Could the way in which we honour each other in our different points of view and love each other even when we disagree actually be the riches out of which God's generosity flows to our neighbourhood? Is that where the treasure is? One of the most treasure-filled communities I'm privileged to belong to for this season is the Explore Together team. Explore Together, if you haven't been, is an absolute joy. Uh, You need to come and experience it. And I believe that part of the reason it's such a blessing is that the small community who plan it are a pretty diverse group. Within the team, we have a variety of church cultures, ways of interpreting the Bible, and ways of expressing ourselves. And this often leads to heartfelt sometimes uncomfortable discussions when we're planning the sessions. We've all learned so much about ourselves and the others as we bring our different passions, traditions and beliefs to the table because we ultimately gather around Jesus. He is the centre of our community and our motivation. He's the reason we gather and plan and serve and the blessing of that unified, not uniform community spills out and blesses many others who come along to the services. Community is the riches out of which God's generosity flows. Well, as I come into land, I hope you've enjoyed thinking a little bit about community. Just to recap, community is godly, is of God, because God is community in himself. We looked at how community is intentional, but also spirit fuels. We explored how community is costly, but worth it. And finally, how community is the riches out of which God's generosity flows. So we can pray along with Christ, come unity. Thank you. I'd like to invite the band just to um, come up, please. Um, We're going to have a time of uh, sung worship, but also a chance um, to be prayed for today. You may find that something I've said today has provoked you, and I would encourage you to linger with that and to ask God to show you what that's about. Um, But as I was preparing, I was also hearing from God that he would possibly like to bless certain um, people today. And the first group is community builders, or people who would like to be community builders. So these are often people in the background. You won't notice them, but you'll know if you are one. You're the kind of person who introduces people to other people. You organize events where people can come together. Um, But it's hard work. 
Um, And I feel like God would love to encourage you today that the work you're doing is just so close to his heart. And he'd love to fill you again with his spirit to keep you going. So community builders, all those aspiring to be community builders. Um, Secondly, I wanted to highlight that I think God would like to comfort those who have been hurt in community Because communities are made up of flawed human beings, aren't they? We do hurt each other. Sometimes that happens. And I feel today that God would like to meet you in that hurt and acknowledge it and bring you some comfort and some hope. And thirdly, I'd like to pray, or we'd like to pray, for those who feel like they just don't fit in community. Maybe you haven't found a role or a space where you feel comfortable Maybe you feel even like an outsider. And I feel like God would love to draw you to himself and remind you of your place in his community of the Trinity and to reassure you that there is a place for you. So as we uh, worship together, um, we're going to have um, a place at the front over here. Um, And if any of those three things, or you just would like someone to pray for you today, please do come over and and receive prayer while we sing these songs. Okay, thank you.